Guys, Dustin Poirier foiled the notorious McGregor's return to the octagon. We're talking about the amazing performance by the Diamond right now. What's up, Barn Hill family? Welcome back to the channel. Yo, yo. So, Nick, the first pay-per-view 2021 is in the books. That's right. For McGregor Nation, it did not go as planned, to say the least. If you're from Louisiana and you love Dustin the Diamond, it must have been about the best night of the year thus far for you. Uh, it was an amazing fight for as long as it lasted. I thought it was a competitive fight for as long as it lasted. Ultimately, the uh, thing that got Dustin over the hump were those calf kicks that really added up. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I will say that uh, whether you're a Connor fan, Dustin fan, or just a fan of fighting, that was a great night of fights. Uh, the main event and co-main event absolutely delivered. Uh, we kind of figured out some things that we needed to have get figured out of 155. And um, yeah, Connor looked super, super sharp uh, in the first round. I think some of uh, Dustin Poirier's game plan was to get him up against the fence, try to tire him out a little bit, drag it into the later rounds like we thought might be the best uh, game plan for him to go in against Connor. Uh, it looked like that paid off for him. I was surprised he landed a takedown because it didn't look like the most technically sound takedown of all time, but it worked. I think it was an unexpected takedown more so than anything. I think yeah. in the preparation for this fight, the Connor camp didn't really think that Dustin would go for an early takedown. So I think it almost caught him by surprise. But Connor did do a good job of kind of shuffling his butt yeah. to get to hit, you know, against the fence and then ultimately get up. Yeah, that fence is is works wonders for you if you're in if you're in need. And, you know, you have a good grappler on top of you. For sure. Um, I think Dustin, I, there was a lot of mind games going on all week, maybe all month uh, leading up to this fight. Connor was saying it was going to go 60 seconds. Dustin was saying within 60 seconds it was going to be bl a, bl a bloodbath. And then to see, you know, Connor come out right out of the gate and then Dustin go right for a takedown, it was like they were uh, playing with each other uh, mentally. Yeah, and you know, talk about mental warfare. The McGregor camp has always been known for their ability to get inside opponents' heads. One thing that I found really interesting, we were listening to the podcast together on a ride the other day in the car, yeah. uh, was when John Kavanaugh was being interviewed by Ariel Helwani, and John Kavanaugh made the comment that they had trained most of this camp in an orthodox position. As we know, Connor's mostly a southpaw. Right. He's got the power in his left hand which is usually his backhand and and you know the way he fights uh for whatever reason Kavanaugh made the comment that they trained most of this camp in an orthodox position and then after that asked Ariel to please cut that out of the podcast yeah. because he didn't want to reveal that tidbit of information but Ariel didn't actually take it out of the podcast which makes me think that it was kind of a work yeah I don't know what to think about that that really didn't play into the fight but it just goes to show you that the McGregor camp is always thinking about mental warfare but I don't think they really consider the mental warfare that maybe the Poirier camp was playing on them yeah I think it was a little bit of both and and props to both teams they came in clearly both these athletes looked like they were ready for you know the performance of their life and while Connor did look sharp in some of the exchanges especially in the first round I mean some of that slipping defense was really sharp some of his punches and uh striking attempts looked a little bit a little bit sloppier than what we usually see out of yeah. Connor especially in the beginning of the fight later as the fight goes on everybody tends to get a little bit sloppier but you know Dustin also had a little bit of that sloppy style coming in and it was weird because they weren't really engaging in just a straight fire fight. They were trying to get their offense off and then play a little defense, get their offense off. But they would wind up doing a little bit of sloppy stuff and, and leaving themselves a little bit compromised in certain areas. Um, but, you know, after that first round, I was pretty confident that uh, Connor was going to get either a stoppage finish or really start to break away in round two. And boy, was I wrong. Yeah, you know, I picked the second round stoppage for Connor when we did the predictions right. video. After and I was, was feeling, right. <laughs> yeah, I was feeling very good about myself uh, leading in, going into the second round. Yeah. I thought Connor largely won the first round. Um, I think he did a good job of, I think Dustin did a fantastic job of mixing in a takedown early on. I don't think Connor was expecting that. Mm -hmm. And it scored points for him. It kind of, I think, put Connor on his heels a bit, thinking, oh, this guy maybe has some wrinkles and some things that uh, I wasn't anticipating he come into this fight with. There was some reversals on the cage in the clinch yeah. position. Dustin threw a few shoulder strikes of his own. You know, we saw the yeah. the, the McGregor Cerrone shoulder strikes uh, come into effect there in the clinch position. The thing that Dustin did so well, and I made the comment at the end of the first round, I said I think Connor 
really did good that round. He landed some good shots. Uh, he was able to slip. It looked like he was the crisper of the two striking of the two strikers, but he has got to address that low calf kick. Yeah. He just keeps getting caught with that low calf kick. And one of the things you notice with Connor when he strikes, he does tend to have a wider stance mm -hmm. than a lot of people. And he does tend to kind of lean forward because Connor is so good at slipping and moving and getting just enough out of range to counter you. And that's how he finishes a lot of his opponents. And that's all fine and good, but the downside to that sometimes is he put a little he puts a little bit too much weight in that front leg. Mm -hmm. And if you have all of your weight riding in that front leg, you can't get it out of the way fast enough if somebody rips a leg kick or right. rips a calf kick. And Dustin did an excellent job of picking up on that, making that adjustment from the first fight and saying, you know what, if I want to take away the power in this hand chop the legs down yeah. because you can't throw power if you don't have your legs underneath you. And right. Dustin did an excellent job of implementing a low calf kick. Yeah, that was spectacular. And you can't, not only can you not uh, throw a lot of offense, but you can't get away that quickly in defense when you don't have your legs under you at a hundred percent. When, when Connor first started to engage at the very beginning of the first round, Dustin started with the calf kicks and the low kicks and, and Connor was able to use his legs to jump back out of the way, not check them or absorb them, but get out of the way completely of them. And I was like, Oh wow, the speed is going to be a difference in this fight. But, uh, D Dustin was able to find the timing and then he was able to start scoring on it. And he realized every time Connor would come in, that leg would be heavy and it would be there for him to score on. And uh, it really paid off for him. I mean, Connor left on crutches. Yeah, he's sit sitting on his yacht right now with it up, elevated, as doctors will tell you to do. And and you know, Connor, as far as the game plan, once Dustin got him to the ground, that was smart. And it was so funny to see them work up up to their feet into the clinch, and then see the trademark shoulders start to get thrown. And Dustin threw a few back of his own. What I found so interesting is if you watch a fight. In per, if you watch a fight and you're just viewing it and trying to figure out who won rounds, uh, it's it's pretty obvious to tell, right? Like you can kind of tell. Right. But then when you go to the statistics, they can read a whole different story. Totally different. And I would have assumed that Connor was significantly ahead on strikes landed, significant strikes especially landed, uh, and then perception of the fight. Uh, I think he was ahead come at the end of round one. But when you looked at the end of the uh, the end of the fight, you see the significant strikes and the numbers and everything like that. Poirier actually had better numbers. He had more strikes. And it's not because he had some super long flurry at the end where, you know, you rack up 30 or 40 punches yeah. landed. His, his ground and pound to finish the fight wasn't all that long. Definitely not more than 10 punches unanswered. Uh, so... It was weird. I, I guess some of his shots were landing that we didn't quite see, and some of Connors were doing more damage, but he wasn't landing quite as many as Dustin. So it's a very interesting fight. Yeah, it, it was very, very interesting. And I wish we could have heard uh, the commentary as we were watching it. Guys, yeah. just a little side note here. Uh, we were very upset about yeah. ESPN Plus last night. We sat down, ordered the fight. I'm over here at Nick's house. Yeah. We're getting ready to to watch. And then of course, like a lot of you all experienced on Twitter, we had a total blackout. We totally missed the Amanda Rebus fight. The first, we, we got uh, to a bar halfway through the JoJo Calderwood fight. We had to crowd, pack ourselves in. Wait for a table. Wait for a table. Try the best we could to read the subtitles. Uh, that is how a lot of people like to enjoy fights and I'm not knocking on that, but for us, I like to hear the commentary. Mm -hmm. I like to discuss things. I like to talk in between rounds and, right. and hear what the, you know, the commentators are saying. Unfortunately, we didn't get that last night and I have not had a chance to go back and rewatch the fight because we were never able to purchase the pay-per-view. So yeah. we do need to eventually, hopefully they'll, they'll put it out and ESPN plus and the UFC has got to do better with this streaming. I mean, I'm all for the streaming service. I think that's where the world is going, but yeah. I mean, when, when you have tens of thousands of people on ESPN, Dana White's and the UFC's social media pages complaining that they're not getting through, some of whom have already spent their money. Luckily, the, the platform wouldn't take our money, so we right. didn't get I'm not going through the process of now trying to get it back. I know a lot of you guys out there are and I understand the frustration. But that being said, um, you know, I didn't get to hear uh, I've gone back and since watched the post fight speeches and things yeah. like that. Uh, what strikes me is that Dustin is really seemingly only interested in a few fights. And I don't think Khabib is coming back anytime soon. I think the way things shook up last night, you know, if Connor had gone in there and been really impressive, knocked Dustin out, 
and got on the microphone and said something creative to sort of entice Khabib out of retirement. Maybe he wants to end his career 30 and 0, beating McGregor again and putting a staple on it, making a boatload of money, beating up a guy he doesn't really care for. I could have seen that happening. I don't, the, the Dustin fight with, with uh, Khabib really wasn't all that competitive. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not dying to see Dustin Khabib too. Uh, and so I think Dustin kind of looking forward realizes that that Khabib fight is not going to be there. And he basically said, there's three fights that interest me right now. One is the rematch with McGregor, because after the fight, they said, okay, it's one and one now. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have a one and one with two great fighters, you have to go to the rubber match. He said, I've always wanted to kick Nate Diaz's ass, Mm -hmm. which signed me up for that. Signed me up for Poirier versus Diaz. And then he said, Charles Oliveira has done a lot of heavy lifting, as has he. And he wants to fight somebody who's done heavy lifting, done something within the UFC promotional banner, and he said he is in no way, shape, or form interested in a Michael Chandler fight, nor will he be until Michael Chandler does more than win one fight against a guy who he already beat. So that being said, where do you think, because it was kind of moving day at 155 yesterday, where, where, where do we go from here? What matches do we make from here for Connor and for Dustin? Well, I, you know, some of the people commentating on it after the fight were saying, well, let's just throw winner, winner. Uh, winner versus winner, loser versus loser. I don't see no. any c- scenario where Conor McGregor is locked in the cage with Dan Hooker in his next fight. And no. I don't see any scenario where Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler fight each other next. I think that uh, there's very few fights on, in the world and that have ever happened that are bigger than a belt. And Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier for the third, for the trilogy, for the rubber match is bigger than the belt. They said that was pretty much the belt in, in, uh, fight anyways. Dustin said, you know, he gave me an opportunity to get a shot back. Now I'm going to give him a shot back. I think that that's the smartest move for Dustin. More eyes are on Dustin Poirier when he's fighting Conor McGregor than ever before. And to get in the octagon, uh, have a a chance to say that, yes, you're willing to do that again. Get in the octagon with Conor McGregor again. Go through a McGregor fight week. Go through the Conor mania that it is a real thing. And, I mean, you're getting headline news. You're getting national coverage all the time when you're lined up to fight Conor. I think as far as uh, Dustin Poirier's next move, it makes total sense for it to be against Conor McGregor. I understand if the UFC doesn't want to put the title on that line. But look, Conor McGregor's a pretty lucky guy. And if Khabib really isn't coming back, and after what Dana said he uh, told him, and he, you know, he was pretty blunt about it, he said, D- Dana, be, be honest with yourself. Do you really think that any of these guys are on the same level that I am? Yep. And, and Dana goes, he has to be honest with himself. He says, no, I don't, I, you know, I've seen how you dealt with all the guys that are beating all these other guys. You know, you, you dealt with Poirier. He looked the best last night. Yep. You've dealt with uh, Justin Gaethje. You've dealt with all of them, Conor McGregor, finishing them and making it look easy. So I think that uh, maybe they will give Dustin the opportunity to fight for a belt next. I think yep. that, I think he deserves it. And if it just so happens to be against Conor McGregor, there's worse things yeah. in life than Conor getting a win, a, a title shot after a loss. I, I agree, uh, but I, I here's what I would like to see next. You know, the Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz trilogy has never really had an expiration date on it. But that being said, I do think that if they're going to make that third fight, they should do it sooner rather than later. And Conor McGregor is always in a big fight. He's always in a main event in the... Uh, other half of the dance card is somebody big. So Mm -hmm. that's why it's not going to be Dan Hooker. So what I think they ought to do is they ought to put Connor versus Diaz three together. Mm -hmm. And I would say, let's go ahead and get the rematch right away with Connor and Dustin. But there's one reason why I'm hesitant to say that. And that is none other than Dubronx, Charles, Charles Oliveira. The performance that he just put on Tony Ferguson, the master class against the boogeyman, the absolute domination of a legend earned him a title shot. Yeah. And I think I would like to see, because Dustin Connor three can be there. What I would like to see happen is Connor versus Nate Diaz for the trilogy. I'd like to see, and I'd like to put a, a, a time clock on Khabib here. And it, you know, Khabib, honestly, Chael Sonnen said it best, is like the girl that we keep inviting to the dance and she keeps saying, no, eventually her mom is going to call and say, hey, stop harassing my daughter. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that is a little bit of how I think Dana's holding out hope and 
hold, you know, on a wing and a prayer that Khabib's going to come back. We need to put like a definitive date on this. Khabib is going to make a decision by X date if he hasn't made it already. If he doesn't make the decision by then, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go forward with Charles Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier for the undisputed title. It's only fair. Dustin's already had a touch of the interim gold. Mm -hmm. He deserves a crack, another crack at the undisputed gold. I think the most deserving person would be Oliveira. And I would love to see uh, McGregor and Diaz go ahead and get their third fight out of the way while that's going on so that the winner could fight for that title next. Yeah, and, and that's a great number one contenders match. And I, I get that there's multiple number one contender matchups that will take place this year. Uh, I I am of the same belief of Dustin Poirier that I don't think my, what Michael Chandler did in one minute last night in the UFC, his only minute of fighting in the UFC, is enough to give him a title shot in the most stacked best division the the sports ever seen. Agreed. Agreed. I think I think Michael Chandler will fight for a UFC title and will probably do it within the next 18 months, maybe I'd even say sooner. So. Mm -hmm. But he's got to do something. He he looked like he was fighting a sleeping Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker was literally just trying I don't think he gave him enough respect and was just kind of circling around because he didn't have any answers for a tenacious come forward fight style like like Chandler was presenting him. I think that Dan Hooker just overlooked him, thought that, you know, the big leagues is something that he's not used to and, and he's not going to be able to hang. And boy, was he wrong. But I think Michael Chandler needs to get in there with, you know, a, a Justin Gaethje, right. a Tony Ferguson, somebody like that. He's already said he wanted to fight both of those guys. Uh, I don't think I, – I just don't see how they can give Michael Chandler a shot at the title – after one minute of, of action. Yeah, I don't think it makes any sense. One, one minute of action against a guy that's now on a two-fight losing streak. Um, yeah. I agree. Dan Hooker, I said it the whole week. First of all, he comes into the pre press conference seemingly with a black eye, yeah. which makes you wonder, makes you question his uh, training methods leading up, leading up to the fight. Why, why do you have a black eye that close to a yeah. fight? Were you sparring the week of uh, the fight? Yeah. You know, it, it seemed like he was a bit out of it. He was just a step behind all week. Michael Chandler showed up to the press conference in a Gucci jacket, looking like a million bucks, talking about this is the big stage and I'm ready to perform on it. And that's why I changed my pick. When we originally talked about this fight a few weeks ago, I said, I think Hooker's got the length. He's got the experience with the takedown defense uh, against a lot of grapplers uh, because he his main training partner is Israel Adesanya, who is a master striker, who's almost as masterful at his takedown defense as he is at his actual striking. Right. So I thought that Hooker would be able to kind of foil the, the, the kind of short, stocky wrestler with an overhand uh, Chandler style of fighter. Um, I, I changed my mind as it went on. I saw how right. prepared Chandler looked. I watched some footage of him training. He's with Henry Hooft. His striking is coming along very well. He looked like he's prepared. And there's a certain uh, look that somebody has in a feel when they're ready to rise to the occasion and ready to, to put on a show and perform at a higher level than they've ever performed at. And I saw that look in Michael Chandler fight week. And that's why I changed my prediction. Um, I, having said all that, I do think Michael Chandler will be fighting for a belt at some point. I don't think that he deserves it off of one win against a guy who's got two losses in a row. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, he should be very proud of himself. That was basically a flawless victory. Yeah. He looked like a million bucks. He sounded good on the on the microphone. He did the call outs. He did what he needed to do. Um, but, you know, I just think we need to see him do at least one or two more fights before we, we really throw him in there and, and you know, crown him a, a ufc champion yeah. or at least you know give him the opportunity and you know there's some fun fights for him and, 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 and again if this if this wasn't the 155 division yeah like let's say that bellator had like just a stellar light heavyweight yeah they do actually in nimkov the guy that just just beat ryan bader like let's say he he goes on a tear and just you know wins five defends his belt five times in a row comes over to the ufc and there's kind of a void at 205 and he comes in and he has an impressive win I'm not opposed to a one win title shot for a newcomer. Right. I'm opposed to it in this particular situation because that would take a title shot away from Charles Oliveira, away from Justin Gaethje. Uh, you know, the, these the, guys who are on eight fight win streaks. Right, and, right, exactly. Justin, who just lost to Khabib, but everybody loses to Khabib. Right. So everybody that has ever tried to beat him has failed. So. You know, how do you factor in the amazing performance against Tony Ferguson that both of those men had right. in 2020? So 
I think just being that it's the 155 division and being that there's so many big names out there, I think the only logical thing to do with Chandler is to put him against Gaethje. Yeah. So almost, th this is how I would see it in my dream scenario. You do the, the trilogy with Diaz McGregor. Mm -hmm. You do Gaethje versus Chandler, which I think that is an, is an incredible fight. Excellent fight. And then you do Dustin Poirier versus Charles Oliveira for the undisputed title. Khabib officially relinquishes, steps back and says, I'm off uh, into the sunset. I'm training my up and comers. As we see, his cousin looks spectacular yes. on Wednesday night. Uh, you know, he's got a different role. And oh, by the way, you don't have to, as, as GSP showed us, you don't have to, to, to commit to your decisions in perpetuity. Yeah. You can change your mind. Things can change. Yeah. You can come out of retirement. And guess what? Khabib is the only person I would ever say this about. You get an immediate title shot anytime mm -hmm. you come out of retirement, anytime you want it right. at 155. But just in the meantime, go ahead and relinquish the belt. Yeah. Let's get it on for the undisputed Oliveira Poirier. And then if you ever do decide to come back, whoever happens to be the champ at the time, you get a crack at him. I think that's fair. That's fair. And, you know, let's just say Conor McGregor winds up with the title and he gets a he gets an itch to go beat up Conor McGregor again. He calls him out. He gets that fight. Conor wants to get it back anyways. And if he believes as well, uh, you know, believes in his skills like he, he should, he'll go take the title away and then give it back just like GSP. I think that's the best move for, for Khabib. I think that's what we'll see Khabib do if he does ever come back. I think also what we can do is get get on with the division sooner than later because Dustin didn't take that much damage. Right. I think we'll see Dustin within the next three or four months. I would love and to I see would that. love and Oliveira's coming fresh off of a victory uh, late last year. So he only needs a couple of more months to get himself lo uh, low on the weight and, and ready for a title fight. And I think if you present that to him, he's going to come ready to fight and you're going to have an amazing fight for the undisputed title. Absolutely. And then, and then that also, you know, you have that undisputed and then Connor addressed last night. My problem is time inside the octagon. You know, there's only so much you can replicate with sparring mm -hmm. and training that the actual time and comfortability in the octagon, he said, I, it was a noticeable difference. Dustin felt more comfortable than I did in there, at least from, from Connor's perspective. And I need rounds. I need time in the octagon. Yeah. Well, excuse me, who better to give you rounds and time than Nathan Diaz? Yeah, you're gonna go. You ain't knocking him out first round, as, you're going as you know. A war. Yeah, you're 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 gonna get the round you asked for. That's yeah. the old adage: be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Yeah. But I think that would be the best thing for Connor. I don't think Connor is injured. I mean, his his leg is chewed up, and yeah. you hit me with that shot all the time. And we're talking about with shin guards on at half speed. That shot hurts it getting does. kicked in the calf sucks mm -hmm. and it takes away your mobility it takes away your ability to throw with any type of power um and you know connor's got to work on a better check of that leg kick yeah he thought he was checking it but the check was still landing on the muscle with it with that kick you've got to get it to where it's bone on bone and even though that sucks and that hurts it's going to hurt the person throwing the kick just as much as it is you. And they may not be so willing to just throw it, you right. know, every 30 seconds like Dustin was doing last night. Um, but yeah, I, I think that would be um, the, the way to solve this 155 mix up. And then you put Chandler in versus Gaethje. The only question then is, does Hooker just become a gatekeeper now? Yeah, well, he took his gloves off, so I don't know what yeah, that, by the way, what that, that meant. He, you know, either he's frustrated and just wanted to go home. Maybe he's uh, uh, so ashamed of the performance that he just didn't didn't even want to have him on. Maybe the the retirement thought was going through his mind. Who knows? Uh, I'm sure we'll find out more about that. It's it's crazy to see Eugene Behrman's fighter uh, lay an egg, and yeah. as, as far as game plan, they didn't come in with anything good, and I, I you never see that Volkanovski has a flawless game plan when he goes against Max Holloway. Uh, Izzy Adesanya, uh, you don't have to say anything yeah. about that. He's he's His record speaks for itself. He's always perfect, but Dan Hooker just seemed out of it the entire yeah. time. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll get a good fight out of him next, and I'm sure it'll be a fun one. But uh, at, at this point, there's some, there's some monsters, 6 through 10, at, yeah. in the 155 division, and we might see him uh, take on a, a serious potential contender yep. around there. Yeah, unfortunately, I think Dan is going to be that guy that uh, 
sort of keeps the gate for those trying to get into the top five. Yeah. I think he beats a lot of people. He, he just seemed out of it. He didn't yeah. seem like himself. As you said, Eugene's fighters are always crisp. They're always mentally sharp. They're always technically sharp. Mm-hmm. They always have a good game plan. I mean, for God's sake, who can come up with a game plan to beat Max Holloway twice in a row at 145? Or a, 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 or a kickboxer to beat Yoel Romero. And, exactly. and stuff takedowns. So. Exactly. So, and, and so it, it just seemed like Hooker was missing a step. As you said, he took his gloves off. I don't know what that alludes to. I, we, yeah. I, we, I didn't have not seen any content that's come out yeah. with him discussing that yet. Um, so as we're filming this video, I haven't right. seen anything. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think Hooker needs to be done by any means. No. He lost to Dustin Poirier and Michael Chandler. Yeah. He has the body for 170. Yeah. Maybe we'll see him get a fresh coat of paint, go up to 170, fight some new guys that are around his same size. So he doesn't have to worry about the the low center of gravity yeah. gra- uh, grappler that's going to try to go get real low on him and make him have to fight long yeah. and, and down, which leaves his face susceptible to shots. One thing that Dustin did say about that leg kick is he said one of the first ones that he landed landed so flush, he said it was more towards the middle or, or top side of his shin that hit the exact side mm-hmm. uh, just under Connor's knee. And he said that w- usually when you land that one, if it lands on your foot, it doesn't quite have the impact, but he goes, when you land that part of your shin right on the lower part, just under their knee, it can really do some damage. And uh, he said he landed it perfectly a couple of times right at the beginning. And uh, that, that really, yeah, I mean, it, it's essentially taking a broomstick and whacking mm-hmm. somebody in the calf or as a baseball hard as you bat. can whack. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like that you can't take too yeah. many of those. You have to check kicks. There's and, a reason the police baton gets used and they 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 slide it out and hit you right in the back of the knee. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's, it's horrifying. And and you know, it's those those kicks really take the mobility. They and do. so Connor's got to work on a check. I don't think Connor really did anything wrong in his game plan. Dustin just realized that hey, Connor is a little heavy on that front leg. Sometimes his stance is a little wide. I'm going to use that to my advantage yeah. and you know, kudos to him. He did and, a great job. And we always say, you, you know, when you're fighting somebody, when you're sparring, whatever, engage on your own terms, you don't want to go in there and get into a firefight. You don't want to do it with anybody, even if you are really good at that. And you know, it works for people like Justin Gaethje sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't. When you're a crisp striker like McGregor and you can keep your distance and you can stay just on the edge of striking range, you do that. But and he looked really good while he was doing that. But as soon as Dustin connected on him, you saw him back up a little yeah. bit. And instead of getting using his legs and getting the heck out of there and putting his hands up, he started to look for his own shots. And when that happens, it becomes a 50-50 sh- who who can land first. And Dustin got to the got to the punch first. It's like it's I look at it like uh like like the war like if you're in a war if you have a tactical sniper who's sitting up in the and only engaging on his terms he sees his target hits it and every time his target's just running straight down the the street he has to hit him it's easy for him to do that it, the game changes completely and turns to a 50-50 when both of them just start running towards each right. other and when you when you take all the barriers and all the blocking away and you just run towards somebody it's whoever's bullet or whoever's shot lands first yep And I want to make one final point, and that is to say, um, to give a little bit of hope to the Dan Hooker fans out there, Dustin Poirier at 145 would have been knocked out in the first round by some of the shots that landed on him. Mm -hmm. 155, the the, the size. He's more durable. He's much more durable. He's able to take a shot. He's not cutting the extreme amounts of weight. Maybe that needs to be a lesson for Dan Hooker. For all fighters. (laughs) For God's sakes, he knocked out Gilbert Burns. Let's not forget that. He knocked Gilbert Burns out, who's fighting Kamara Usman, who very well couldn't be the next 170 Who would love to get that fight back. And, you know, a couple of wins at 170. Now we have Hooker in a title fight at 170. Crazy things happen in this sport. And uh, I'm, I'm just excited to see what happens for all of these guys especially uh, the top four that just fought in uh, at the lightweight division. Uh, I- I'm super excited. No question. Guys, thanks so much for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and let us know what you thought about the fights in the comments. And check us out where you listen to audio. Have Peace. a great day.